Well, good morning, everyone. In this uh, session, I want to uh, introduce you to the uh, foundational concept uh, that provides us an understanding of the uh, working of the market economy. And Ludwig von Mises called this concept economic calculation. <clears throat> and the cornerstone of this foundation of economic calculation uh, is the theory of market prices. And so that's uh, what we're going to do in this uh, uh, session is talk about mainly about market prices and how uh, market prices form the basis for engaging in economic calculation and then in turn economic calculation is what provides the possibility of a social economy, a, a market economy, a division of labor economy. So we'll proceed, uh, proceed in four steps. The first step I'll just talk about some of the basic uh, principles of human action as a, as a ground on which to proceed. And then we'll talk about what uh, we call the personal economy. And this is the first part of our um, title, right, subjective value. We'll, we'll show how it is that you and I and every person uh, formulates a personal economy on the basis of valuations we make. Uh, and then we'll move to the social economy. What happens when we want to integrate our personal economies? How do we do this, right, in, in an effective way? And this is where we get to the principle of economic calculation and what, uh, again, Ludwig von Mises calls appraisement. So we'll talk a little bit about those uh, concepts. And then the, the for fourth thing that we'll do is talk about the theory of price. We'll talk about the determination of market prices. <clears throat> okay, so you probably heard already that uh, we begin uh, economic analysis with the concept of human action. Human action is just purposeful behavior. It just means that it's human behavior directed toward the attainment of an end. It's quite obvious upon immediate reflection of this idea that having an end in and of itself does not constitute action. We can have all sorts of ends that are unmet, <clears throat> uh, that uh, we have not yet uh, attained. That as human beings, because we're finite beings, we have to uh, first identify and then acquire and then control the use of means in order to act to the attainment of our ends. If we were infinite beings, we could just attain our ends by willing them. <clears throat> so we have unmet ends uh, at any moment in time, uh, or to say this in the more traditional way, the means available to us are scarce. And because the means available to us are scarce, we have to choose in action. We have to choose in two uh, uh, dimensions. One is, Whatever means we happen to possess, we have to choose which ends we'll pursue with those means. And for any given end that we select, uh, we'll have a choice uh, between different combinations of means to attain the given end. So we have the ends-means framework of action <clears throat> and the way in which we uh, perceive this as, as uh, actors. And so this is where we get to the principle of, uh, of the personal economy. This is, again, what Ludwig von Mises likes to call economizing in action in these choices we economize. That is, we take given means and we choose to apply them to higher valued ends and we set aside ends that we value as less highly. Uh, for a given end, we choose to arrange the means in a way that uh, the combination is less valuable than alternative combinations of arrangements of means which are more valuable. We economize, right? This is the uh, mode of human action, we might say, or the logic of human action. <clears throat> uh, since we already mentioned, though, that, uh, value, uh, that when we value in this way, we're always choosing, we're always then comparing the value of one alternative to the value of another. And this is what, in economic theory, we call preference or preferring. And since we're talking about the real action of real human persons, when we talk about preference, we're talking about what uh, Murray Rothbard liked to call demonstrated preference. We're not talking about uh, our uh, thought process of things that we like or don't like. We're talking about what we do in action, how we choose in, in, uh, between the alternatives available to us in action. So our preferences our, our valuations, in other words, are always demonstrated in action. They're uh, coincident with action. 
Uh, there are two basic features then of uh, value in, in this uh, logical sense. One is the subjectivity of value. And by subjective, what we mean as economists is that value is nothing more than an intensive state of mind. Value exists only in our minds. It's a state of mind. It lacks an extensive property. There's nothing outside of our mind that is uh, related to the value that we're assessing in our minds. It's a judgment that we make in our minds. This is the idea of subjectivity. <clears throat> now, if this is correct, if value is uh, subjective, without an extensive property, then we cannot measure value. Value is not a substance or something that exists objectively outside our minds that we can have a shared ex experience of and come up with a unit of value. We can't say, I get 10 units of value from eating a chocolate ice cream cone. This is just like a nonsense uh, statement, right? I mean, you could never make sense of this because we don't have a shared notion of what a unit of value might be. It's only in my mind, and then you can have value, of course, in your mind, but never the twain shall meet, right? We don't have an objective way of comparing uh, value. Uh, hopefully you can see right away uh, uh, the truth of this uh, proposition is what presents the problem of arranging a so an efficient or an economizing social economy. How are we supposed to do this when we can't actually know what other people value by our own experience. We can only experience our own personal uh, assessments of things. <clears throat> uh, now, the other feature that I want to mention of subjectivity, which is sometimes confused with the principle of subjectivity, is that value is not constant, or at least we cannot assume that it's constant. And by this, we mean, in particular, that there, there's no quantitatively constant relationship between external circumstances that, that, uh, that surround our action and the subjective value that we place upon acting in these circumstances. There's no known quantitative relationship here. <clears throat> and hopefully you can see that what follows from this, of course, is that we can't formalize economic laws in mathematical style, right? We can't, because there are no constants. Everything is a variable. And if there are no constants, well, okay, certain things we might see are related, but we can't have formal expressions of this relationship that are quantitatively definite. That, that is not a principle of subjectivity per se. That comes from the fact that uh, we simply don't know what the connection is quantitatively between external circumstances, our judgments, and then the way we act. Like uh, the price of the product that's external to the, my, my mind and how much of the good I buy. Because that, that action takes place through my mind and there, there isn't any known quantitatively fixed relationship between the external circumstance, my mind, and then the, the consequence, my action, that's a consequence of this. <clears throat> All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to another, uh, uh, a final principle, and I want to do a little comparison here. And this is the idea that uh, um, economists call imputation of value. So all we've said up to this point is that we value in action the attainment of the end. <clears throat> but uh, does this mean that uh, the means that we use in action do not have value, or, or how do we, uh, what's the association of the value of the means to the value of the end? And you'll see in the first line, the top line, is the Misesian view, the Austrian view which holds to the logic that we've uh, mentioned already. If human action is purposeful, if the point of human action is to attain the end, then the value of the end drives everything else in action, logically. The value, the value of a consumer good is valued by a person only because it's an aid to the attainment of the end, whatever the end is. <clears throat> the value of producer goods are only uh, assessed or valued uh, by the person uh, with respect to the aid that they give in producing the consumer good. So here we're not talking about some sort of philosophical notion of the value of things. We're not talking about the, you know, the intrinsic value that God sees in the created order or something like this. We're just talking about human beings engaged in action to attain ends. And here the logic must flow in this, in this fashion, right? So that's, that, this is a way, of course, that the price structure in the market will then flow. Now, the second line is the British classical uh, way of thinking about the relationship between these things. 
uh, that, uh, that culminates in Karl Marx, right, in the labor theory of value. Value is intrinsic in the producer good. It's transmitted to the consumer good by production. Our minds assent to this value somehow. It's you know uh, consistent. We see it as consistent with the uh, with the labor embedded in the good. Now we're gonna, not going to go through a long demonstration of why this is false. I just want to point out that this can't be true if our uh, discussion of the ends means relationship is true, right? This can't be true if human action is actually, uh, the value of it is centered upon attaining the end. Then it can't be the case that, the, that there's intrinsic value, value separate from that, from some other source in the means themselves, right? <clears throat> and then the final uh, line, the third line, is the neoclassical view from, say, Alfred Marshall that uh, the, the consumer good is valued uh, as a, uh, a mutual, mutually determined uh, process by the independent value of the producer goods, the cost of production, and the, and the demand for the good, right, the subjective value. But again, th this cannot be true if, if our ends means discussion is correct. If our ends means discussion is correct, there can be no such thing in human action as independent value of means. The value of means must be as they are aids to the attainment of the end. The, the, the logic of it necessitates this, this top line, right? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now let's go to the, uh, to the, nec to the next step. We, uh, for our purposes in thinking about uh, market prices, we want to take one more step in valuation. So up to this point, we've just said, remember, that each one of us engages in human action. We organize our human actions as a system uh, based upon the way that we value the various ends that we can attain with the various means that we, that we have or that we can acquire uh, through uh, activity, right? Uh, production or trade or whatever, uh, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> but there are a few, uh, there are a few uh, important laws of this valuation process that uh, are useful in thinking about how we integrate once we start to integrate our uh, personal economies. And so here's an illustration. And you can see there are two, two separate sets of laws. On the left-hand side, let's start there with the laws of utility <clears throat> or the laws of value. Utility is just another word for, for value in, in the context of economics. So here's a preference rank on the left-hand side of equally serviceable units of a good. And the good that I picked is an iPhone SE, <clears throat> so the entry-level iPhone. And if a person had just one iPhone SE, the person would allocate it to the most valuable purposes to which they put a, a smartphone, right? And so the value of that iPhone would be imputed to it according to the value the person placed upon doing those tasks. Uh, you know, attaining those consumptive ends. <clears throat> if a person, though, had two iPhones, a second iPhone, that second iPhone would have to have less imputed value than the first because the second iPhone would have to be applied to the person to a less valuable set of activities because the first iPhone is already available to him to accomplish the most valuable, <clears throat> and so on. And in fact, we, we can even see that it, it's possible that a person would have so many units of a, of a given good that it would no longer be scarce uh, to the person, right? And, and therefore, they wouldn't value the, the iPhone at all. You imagine Tim Cook if he suddenly uh, uh, embezzled, uh, you, you know, the 100 million iPhones that are in warehouses someplace and went off to Tahiti. I mean, what, what, would it, what value would he place on losing one of them, right? The answer is zero. So you can see, again, the logic of this, of this structure and hopefully you'll notice that this will this will apply to the law of demand when, when we get to the market. But, and then on the right hand uh, column, I, I just got one other uh, law, the law of the allocation of consumer goods. So we know that we don't act with just one consumer good, right? We don't have just a smartphone, although sometimes I wonder about some people. Um, we do other things. So so how is it? Is there a law? Is there a logical principle that? we can apply to the understanding of how uh, uh, each person allocates their acts of consumption across different consumer goods they have. Is there something that's always in place logically there? <clears throat> and the answer here is that, as I've uh, suggested, is that 
uh, a person will allocate different tasks with different consumer goods so that there are no big value differences left after this is done. So in my example, uh, th this person uses the iPhone SE they have in order to FaceTime with their family. I, I know that that's what you know, you're primarily doing with your, with your phones, right? You're sitting in your dorm rooms back at your university and you're, you're FaceTiming with your poor grandma who's you know, eager to see your face and talk with you. Yeah, so you do this for two hours. Why is it two hours? Why isn't it four hours? Or, right? well, well, it isn't four hours because the marginal utility, the extra value of extending activity along this line would be a lower ranked, right? This means that other activity, which is higher ranked in marginal utility, would then come into play. Let's say, my example, uh, this person uh, goes for a run and takes an hour to do this. Why doesn't the person run for two hours? Well, OK, so you see the principle, right? So we're, so we're always allocating across different consumer goods in this way so that we don't see any big value differences that would allow us to shift out of the low-valued activity into the high-valued activity and gain overall. That, that's the logic of it. Uh, OK, now, now let's think about producer goods or the laws of producer goods. Remember when we talked about imputation, we said, Value goes from the mind to the consumer good, then from the consumer good to the producer good, right? The person's imputing along this logical line. So what about producer goods? Are there laws of the use of producer goods? <clears throat> and here, uh, again, there is an important law on the left-hand side, you see it, called the law of returns. So here my example is, suppose this uh, person who has the iPhone lives out in the country and uh, through the property, he's got some land, and through the property in the woods, there's a stream. And in the stream, he can, he, he can go fishing. So the, it's a natural resource, right? And there are fish in the stream. And he's got all the, the uh, consumer goods he needs to go fishing. He's got his, uh, his pole and his line and um, his uh, uh, flies and, you know, whatever. Whatever he, he his waders to go into the stream and whatever. He's got all these complementary factors of production, right? And then he goes into the, into the stream with his labor, and one unit of labor, let's say it's an hour of labor, he fishes and he gets four fish. But hopefully you can see right away that if he continued to do this, if he continued just to apply more and more of a variable input to a fixed input like the stream, he would fish out the stream, right? He would exhaust the physical capacity of the stream. <laughs> and that's a general principle of all production. If we have a fixed uh, complementary factor of production and we add more and more of the variable factor to it to produce more and more, we'll eventually exhaust the finite productive capacity of the fixed factor, in this case, the stream. It could be a factory, it could be a, a farm, it could write anything. This is what we call the law of returns. So the law of returns is a necessary feature of human activity because, again, we're finite beings, right? We live in a finite world. <clears throat> okay, this has the same implication then as the, uh, as the uh, law of utility that we talked about that diminishes as we engage in, you know, having extra units of a consumer good. It means that as we apply more and more of our effort to produce something, we get less and less valuable results. And therefore, we switch to other uh, uh, productive activity because it becomes more valuable as we extend uh, production in, in one line, right? It, 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 then the marginal value product, as we say, the MVP, of doing something else becomes more valuable. And so that's how we allocate across different productive acts by, the, by this logic, right, of thinking this way. So in my example, this, uh, this person fishes one, one, one unit of fish, one hour or whatever the unit is, one hour of fishing, gets the four fish, produces the consumer good, fries the fish, eats the fish, right, for dinner, or whatever is going to mount them on the wall, whatever he's doing with the consumer good. <clears throat> and, then, and then instead of going fishing for another hour, he, he uh, makes a doghouse. The doghouse takes him two hours, but he, he switches and he, and he goes to the doghouse. Now, would he produce a second doghouse? Would he take another two hours in the day to produce another? No, he doesn't do that. Why? Because the marginal value product of using his labor to produce a second doghouse is not worth very much. He only needs one, he's got one dog, he's, right? he doesn't need two. So you see the logic of how this works. <clears throat> okay. 
So just to sum up on uh, the personal economy, if we look at any person, this is the way economists would analyze your behavior or mine. We look at any person, uh, we, we uh, conclude that, um, that their, their personal economy is integrated by them according to their perceptions and intellect, according to how they perceive the world and the possibilities of using, you know, acquiring means and using them and so on. And then by the way that they value uh, the attainment of various ends. <clears throat> so this is the way that we're, we're acting. This is, this is what gives structure and the possibility of economic analysis or any kind of analysis of human action is because, is because we have these principles upon which all human action is based. Now let's turn to the social economy. <clears throat> In the social economy, as we suggested already, each one of us wants to integrate our personal economy with the personal economy of others. That's what the market economy is, right? The voluntary integration of our personal economies. Uh, this, this person doesn't want to produce his own fishing pole. Maybe he could do it, but it would take him weeks or whatever. It would be inferior. He wants to go down to, uh, to, to uh, Agway. Do you have Agways down here? Agway's like a hardware store back in Pennsylvania where I'm from. And buy a fishing pole. He wants somebody else to produce his fishing pole, right? And he's just going to buy it. He's integrating his personal economy. He's acquiring things now that other people have produced. Why does he do this? Why do you and I do this? Well, it's because of the greater productivity of the division of labor. Because I can buy a fishing pole, you know, for whatever, 50 bucks, and uh, I can uh, teach, teach uh, at college and earn 50 bucks much more easily than I can produce my own fishing pole. And I'll get a better pole and so on. Right, you see the the principle involved. So then the question becomes, can, can we as, <laughs> is it possible to arrange a, an economizing social economy by valuation alone? And to think of the problem, there, there are two possibilities of whether this is possible. One would be we could appoint somebody, we could appoint a representative to make the choices for us. Somebody who's objective and independent, because if we try to do this personally, right, we're going we're gonna to be biased and we're going to want things done. You know, I'm going to want the fishing pole for five cents or whatever, right? Or, you know, whoever. We'll, we'll have this interest. <clears throat> so maybe we could appoint a, an unbiased person who would, who would make the decisions for us. But hopefully you can see right away, we alluded to this before, right? The subjectivity of value does not permit this. There isn't any way that uh, a third party can objectively compare the subjective value of someone who wants fish with someone who wants a doghouse with a, with a given person's labor. We, we, it just can't be done, right? It's conceptually not possible to do. This isn't an information problem. This is a, what Mises is called a calculation problem, right? <clears throat> well, so in any case, it simply cannot be done. And we can't do this, we can't even do this uh, by cutting out the representative and having direct democracy because we're in no better position to objectively compare the subjective value between different individuals than some third party, right? The problem can't be solved this way. <clears throat> and a similar, it's similar, of course, with the use of inputs or the use of means. If we're trying to, you know, who's gonna be the fisherman, who's gonna be the baker, who's gonna be, if we're gonna to try to assign different tasks to different people, <clears throat> uh, just on the basis of valuation, we can never do it in a way that's economized. We can do it, right? We, it's easy to assign people and to, you know, if you have the coercive power to force them into different jobs or whatever, or to give them monetary incentive to take a job, that's not the issue. Of course you could do this, but it's not economizing. It doesn't, it's not human to do it this way because it isn't economizing. It isn't choosing the more valuable alternative over the lesser valued. Because we, 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 can't, we can't know what these are, right? They're subjective, and so we can't know what they are. Now, as Ludwig von Mises uh, famously uh, showed us in his uh, 1920 article on uh, economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth, the solution to this, of course, is a market economy. The solution to this is, if we have a market economy with private property, then we can engage in voluntary exchange in a monetary economy, and you'll learn more about the details of this uh, today and tomorrow. Um, then we know who values things, uh, consumer goods, let's say, relative to money more than others. Now we have, we have a, a means for registering people's subjective value 
in a way that generates a, a, an objective evidence about uh, one person's valuation relative to another. This guy goes to Agway, he buys the fishing pole for 50 bucks. Then we know he values the fishing pole subjectively more than he values the 50 bucks subjectively. I go into Agway, I see the fishing pole, I don't buy it. Well, then we know that the guy who buys it values it relative to money more than I do. And so that's the, that's the next step for us to take, right? Uh, is to uh, give an explanation now of money prices. Now, because I probably won't get through the whole, <laughs> the whole discussion of money prices, uh, I want to give you just a, an overview schematic. This is the logic of how it flows out, just in case we don't finish the whole thing. You can uh, take this as a homework problem. So this is how, this is how, uh, this is how our understanding of a market economy exists in, in the Austrian approach, the assessing approach. So as we've, as we've said all along, we've got preferences of, of different persons. We've got this guy uh, who wants the fishing pole and he goes to Agway and he's got preferences. And, and we've got the owner of Agway who has preferences as well. Preference, you know, he's willing to obtain the $50 and sell the pole. <clears throat> and so we have, we have a demand for the consumer good and supply of the consumer good. And that's the interplay between the two, which we'll talk about in a minute, is what determines the price of that fishing pole. It's $50, not $100, not $5. It's determined by the voluntary exchange activity of people expressing their preferences for things willingly uh, in the market. <clears throat> now, once their prices of consumer goods, then two effects come from this. One is expenditure for consumers. So the guy who buys the fishing pole he expends $50, right? He's making expenditures. But the other is the revenue for the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur, Agway, earns the 50 bucks as revenue. So every time there's an exchange of a consumer good, the seller gets the revenue, the, the buyer gets the good, right? The seller gets the money price, the buyer gets the good. <clears throat> so this revenue that's earned by Agway allows the entrepreneur at Agway to fund the purchase of uh, producer goods. So that's the revenue stream that he needs to fund his expenditures to buy the inputs to uh, have, you know, he, he's just a retailer, but he's buying the pole, right, from a wholesaler, and the wholesaler is buying inputs to produce the pole, and so on and so forth throughout the economy. <clears throat> so that's where we get demand for producer goods. The supply of producer goods just come from the workers and the other producers. It's just preferences, right? And again, we'll show this if we have sufficient time. So that's where you get the wages of the pole making workers, the, um, you know, the price of the, of the uh, fishing line and, and the component uh, capital goods that go into making a fishing pole or whatever the product happens to be, <clears throat> the prices of the producer goods. And then the prices of producer goods generate two effects. One is the income for the seller of the, of the uh, producer good. So the worker who makes the fishing pole gets the, the, the uh, wage is, is not a cost, right? It's an income. It's a cost to the entrepreneur. And so on the left-hand side, we see the first uh, principle of economic calculation. The entrepreneurs are going to try to generate production of goods where the revenue from the uh, uh, purchase, from the voluntary purchase of the buyers, will more than cover the costs that the entrepreneur uh, incurs in buying the producer goods, right? That's, that then would be economizing, right? Because the producer goods like this worker who helps to make the fishing pole, uh, the wage is set by the general market for that kind of labor, which means that other entrepreneurs in other fields are also paying whatever the wage is, $25 an hour or whatever the wage is, to hire workers like this. And so if Agway, or if the manufacturer of the pole is, is hiring this worker, what's being given up by other consumers is the value of the things that could have been produced if that worker would have stayed in a different industry. Why doesn't the worker stay in a different industry? Because the, uh, the entrepreneur is paying a better wage or giving better uh, working conditions or whatever, more favorable job opportunity in, in, this, in, in fishing pole production. And so you can see how the economizing structure of the market is formed just by our own uh, attempts to integrate as best we can our own personal economies. Okay, whoops, so let's go to the, let's go to the first uh, part. Sorry about that. Let's go to this, this part. 
this top part uh, and give an explanation of the prices of consumer goods. And if we have time, we'll do the, we'll do the producer goods. So let's start with this case. I'll switch my example a little bit and go back to the, uh, the uh, iPhone SE. And here, let's start with a simple case. And the simple case is, suppose we have a, uh, an iPhone SE Gen 1 that was sold back in 2021. So it's used. So it's owned by just, a, just another guy or gal, right? It's not owned by uh, Apple. And suppose uh, we, so we have this, uh, this uh, potential seller here on the right-hand side who owns the, the used uh, iPhone. And then we have somebody who comes in contact with this person who, who sees that the person has this phone and who's interested in buying it. So the buyer on the left-hand side. And the, the parenthesis around the iPhone SE for the buyer means the, bu the buyer doesn't have it yet. The buyer's only sort of anticipating what it would be worth if, if he had it. The seller has the phone. And you can see by the numbers I've used here that a mutually advantageous trade is possible, right? Because the maximum that the buyer is willing to pay is $340, and the minimum the seller is willing to accept in trade is $300. So they can certainly form a mutually beneficial trade, somewhere between the maximum price the buyer is willing to pay, the minimum price the seller is willing to accept. If that condition exists, then they can, they can have a mutually advantageous trade, right? They can integrate their personal economies. The seller would rather have the money uh, as opposed to the phone to do something else, and the buyer would rather have the phone instead of the money. And so they could, they, this is how uh, they would uh, uh, integrate. Um, it's, a, it's not a uh, logically difficult uh, issue to, to notice that they, they can negotiate the price. Somewhere in between $340 and $300, they can, they can higgle and haggle and, and, uh, set, and you know, come to a mutually agreeable price. I mean, they may not do this, but it's certainly logically possible that they could do this. Right? And then, if they can, then we would have a voluntary exchange at that price. And then, of course, all we need to do in addition is add competition we need to have, you know, we have a market where there are lots of buyers potentially and lots of sellers. And then there, we find willingness then and ability to make trades within, within the group of people in the market. So that would be the next step. <clears throat> now, before we go to that step though, let's take an intermediate point, a side point, which becomes important too. Because even my simple uh, example illustrates the fundamental principles involved in all market exchange. And so this is important to keep in mind. It uh, doesn't matter what the exchange conditions happen to be. On the demand side, the preference of the buyers then always looks like this, right? The value of the good obtained is greater than the value of the money given up if they buy the good. Now, it could be, of course, that they're just looking and you know, potentially buy and they don't buy. But if they buy the good, then at that moment they value the good, the acquisition of the good, more than the surrender of the money. And as far as the value of the money given up, there are two categorical possibilities, right? They could just keep the money for their own personal use, do something else with it, right? <clears throat> or they could uh, surrender the money to a, a more eager seller. Maybe, uh, maybe our iPhone buyer you know, negotiates a little bit with the, with this seller that we mentioned and the seller holds out for $300. Well, maybe that puts in the mind to the buyer. Maybe I can, uh, whatever, go on eBay or uh, extend my circle of friends and find some other uh, potential seller of the iPhone SE who would, uh, who would take it at a better price. <clears throat> who would, right? And, and so, so, so they may, they may refuse to trade uh, uh, on, on the basis of that with any particular seller and uh, seek out another one. And if so, then, well, they're, they're giving up their money then to the most eager seller that they don't deal with. That, that would be their alternative. <clears throat> uh, by the way, we call this, uh, if, if we had a case where the, and we do lots of times, right, a case where the buyer holds out and doesn't trade, he doesn't give up the money, we call that reservation demand. But we'll see that term as sort of important uh, in further discussions. And then supply is just the flip side, right? 
in every act of supply, no matter what the circumstances are, the seller is just engaged in valuation. It's just saying, there's the value of the money obtained, which ranks above the value of uh, keeping the good. And the value of keeping the good could either have a personal use or it could be sold to a, another eager buyer, right? Those are the two categories. So again, Tim Cook has 100 million iPhones in warehouses all over the place. <clears throat> and uh, he's perfectly happy to sell one of the iPhone SEs right now for $429 to anybody who, who puts up the money uh, because he has no reservation demand, right? He has no personal use for the 100 millionth iPhone. He, he just wants to, he wants to sell it. He's produced it to sell it, not to use it personally. That doesn't mean he couldn't, right? That doesn't mean in the abstract a person couldn't have reservation demand for the, for the good and hold out, just keep the good and not sell it. <clears throat> okay, so those are the general principles. It doesn't matter if it's Tim Cook or if, this, if it's this used iPhone that's just owned by Joe Smith or whatever. These are the general principles always involved. Now let's go back to the market uh, analysis. So this is my example, the market clearing price. Suppose this is uh, July 1st, 2000, uh, excuse me, yeah, yeah, 2021. So suppose this was the market uh, a year ago, roughly. <clears throat> uh, what we know if we look at the empirical evidence about the market a year ago for used iPhone SEs is that data point, right? That's the only actual real empirical evidence that we have in markets. We have the price and the quantity traded. Uh, the supply and demand curve are just conceptual structures for economic analysis. There, there are no data points on the supply and demand curve. That's all just our concept of what would happen if the price were higher, what would happen if the price were lower. But the data point is always, the argument is, it's always at the uh, intersection, if you will, at the market clearing point for uh, uh, the conditions of this market. <clears throat> and so our data point, my, my example, the data point is uh, $300 price and 2,100 uh, iPhone SEs used in July 1st, 2021 were bought and sold. I don't know what the actual data was, but something, right? But we could get the actual data and see what it is. <clears throat> now, uh, th the other point about this is what about, why is it that What's the argument that there aren't data points up here on the demand and on the, on the demand and the supply curve? <clears throat> well, the argument is that if if the actual price in the market is 300, if the price instead would have been 320, let's say, then there would be more sellers who would come into this market eager to sell. They're holding out again because. They think the $300 price is unfavorable. They have reservation demand for their iPhone. But at $320 or $350 or $400 or $500, they come into the market and try to sell. Right? At some higher price, they'd be willing to, to sell. But on the demand side, as the price is hypothetically higher, uh, the number of buyers would be reduced or certainly not increased, right? And so we wouldn't have a matching of uh, buyers and sellers. We wouldn't have a full integration of the personal economies of people. We would have, as economists like to say, excess supply at prices above the actual price. We would have some sellers who can't find buyers, and therefore they can't integrate, right? They can't in get involved in a voluntary exchange. And if the price is too low, be below the market clearing point, we would have excess demand. In other words, we would have lo lots of buyers, but not enough sellers. And so we don't get full integration. So what, what's happening with the movement of prices, and we're talking just here about uh, market prices, right? Not interfered with, with by state coercion and so on. The movement of market prices is that prices are moving to accommodate the integration as fully as possible of our personal economies. We get the uh, best result in that, in that sense, right? The fullest integration of our personal economies. Uh, the, to put this a different way around, uh, given that there are a certain number of iPhone uh, SE 2001 Gen 1 on July 1st, there, there are a certain number of them, 20 million or whatever, that exist in the world. When people engage in trade, the, the, the good is moved from people who value it less with respect to money into the hands of people who value it more with respect to money. 
the market is continuously moving goods in, away from people who value the goods less and into the hands of people who value the goods more, again, relative to money. Right? That, and that, that's the accommodation that, that's occurring, or one way to put it. <clears throat> okay, now let's move to the, uh, to the uh, case of uh, new, new iPhones. So we haven't explained that case, right? We have only given you the general principles of how we would uh, start the analysis. So let's suppose we go back again to July 1st, 2021. 20, uh, in order to think about Tim Cook and his entrepreneurial group who are anticipating the beginning of the selling of the 2022 model, the Gen 2 model, that started, I, I don't know exact dates, but started, let's say, on October 15th, 2021. And now they're selling this through October 15th this year, right? This is the Gen 2 uh, iPhone SE. <clears throat> okay, so how, do, how, do, how would uh, Tim Cook think about this, or how would any entrepreneur think about pricing the product? And the answer is, if they don't have reservation demand, which is the way I've drawn this, just, just again for that particular case, if they don't have reservation demand for the good, they're going to try to sell the good um, at, 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 to, to fetch the best price possible, right? They're going to sell it for what the market can bear. And so the way, I've, the way I see this particular circumstance of the iPhone SE, I, I'm just looking at their behavior. <laughs> so they started selling it back in October, and the price was 429 And as far as I know, the price has been 429 every day since then. Maybe they have a sale every once in a while, right? They do a, whatever, a Christmas sale or whatever. <laughs> but but they, they, they've decided, in other words, that $4.29 is the price. That's the price we're going to sell at. And then we're going to let... Uh, we're, uh, we're going to accommodate people as they come day by day to buy at that price. So where do they get the 429 price? Well, they get it by, uh, you know, if we diagram it this way, they get it by their assessment of the fact that they think that if they charge $429 over the production run of, the, of this iPhone, the one-year, right, selling run of this iPhone, that they'll get the best, most revenue possible. If, if, if they charged a price of $500, their, they would, uh, their revenue would be less. If they charge a price of $300, their revenue would be less. And then, as I suggested, they can do different things, right? The entrepreneurs can do different things day to day. Once they decide, okay, the sort of price is, we, we think that the overall market through the selling of this good is going to command a price of $429. They can do what Apple seems to be doing, which is, we're going to keep that price the same no matter what. There may be days where you don't sell a single iPhone, then other days where you sell 50,000, but we're going to keep the price at 429. And how are we going to accommodate the people who come to us and want to buy iPhones? And we're going to hold inventory. We're going to produce the 20 million iPhones, and we're going to put them in a warehouse. And then every time we get an order, we're going to ship. Right? That's how they do it. Or at least it seems that that's what they're doing. Now, they don't have to do it this way, right? <laughs> They could just say, uh, okay, we've got 20 million iPhones and we're going to sell whatever, uh, uh, you know, say 50,000 each day. And if, if demand is shifting around day to day, we're, we're going to move the price so that the market clears. They could do that, right? They could let the price adjust. Or they could do some combination. The, su the, the supply curve doesn't have to be vertical. It could be horizontal. It could be, it could be between the two, right? That this is just an entrepreneurial strategy. But the point is, they're, going to, they're, go, they're always going to uh, ask the price that they think will uh, generate the revenue uh, that, that, that they anticipate, right? Will generate the best revenue for them. So that's how the price gets to 429. <clears throat> um, let me say one, one last thing. I won't go through the rest of the slides, but uh, about the uh, prices of producer goods, but I'll say one last thing. I put the revenue amount at the bottom, right? $429 per iPhone. They sell 20 million. That's just my made up number. I don't know how many they'll actually sell or plan to sell. But if that's the number, then it would be $8.58 billion in revenue. And they'll earn that revenue over the year, right? Every day they'll sell some iPhones and that revenue will come in. And just like we explained already, they're earning that over the year. But they incurred the production costs earlier. Right, it in fact incurs the production cost probably um, 
uh, most of it at least before, before the summer of, of uh, 2021. They're incurring all the production costs first. And so notice when, when they're hiring workers and they're buying materials and they're amortizing the value of their facilities, the, the Foxconn uh, facility in China and so on, the things that they own, right? Uh, they, they, uh, when they're assessing the expense of all this, <clears throat> they're, they're doing so only in anticipation of selling the iPhones to generate this revenue. And this is the entrepreneurial foresight dimension, right, that's expressed in the market um, economy that uh, you'll talk uh, quite a bit more about uh, today and tomorrow. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.